Good morning. We're ready to begin our class. I invite us to, uh, to bow in prayer as we begin our class time together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for uh, this day that you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. And we are glad to gather together to, uh, to open your word, to be thinking about the gospel that you have, uh, have used to, uh, to bring us to faith in Jesus Christ. And it is our desire, O oh Lord, that others would be drawn into this and that, uh, that you would be saving others and that we would be your witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. I'm glad to begin our class today. This is our third class on the subject of evangelism. And as I've been doing last week and, and now going again today, we have... Um, I have a little booklet on 10 myths about, about evangelism that I've given just kind of an intro, a little, little vignettes about uh, different myths. I'm just walking through this little book. And the second one is that the gospel, uh, the gospel isn't enough when evangelizing. So what this myth is interacting with is the idea that you need to try other means in which to get people's attention because the word of God is insufficient. When I say it that way, it sounds foolish. It sounds like, what, what are you talking about? Of course, uh, of course we need the, the, the word of God. Of course we need the, the gospel. Uh, but you'd be surprised at the conversations that revolve around the subject of evangelism that suggest that very thing. And it can come across in, in a number of different ways. And the, the one that, that I'm most interested in is I'm not too worried that we would ever abandon, uh, abandon the gospel. What I'm interested in is the relationship between what I would call lifestyle evangelism and the speaking of, of the gospel. And by lifestyle evangelism, I think you probably understand that there is an aspect of the way in which we live that testifies to our faith in Jesus Christ. And there's the famous quote by uh, it, uh, Francis Assisi, who said, uh, be sure to share the gospel, and, and if you must, use words. And that's quoted often as, as if that your life is the only thing that is necessary with the gospel. And I'm very convinced that our life should testify to our faith in Jesus Christ. But at the end of the day, words must be used. It, it has to come down to, uh, to speaking about, about God and sin and the threat of, of condemnation, the offer of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. It has to be spoken eventually. So just to dispel that, uh, that myth, I'll, I'll remind you that what we are talking about here is going to include your life, it's going to include the way in which you live, but it is also geared at talking to people about Jesus. And uh, so uh, we'll go on now to, uh, to our subject. We have looked at why we are doing this. I've looked at last week. Um, falling in love with the gospel all over again. Uh, today, I want to, uh, to interact a little bit with the other book that I've mentioned earlier, a book by uh, Samuel Chan, Evangelism in a Skeptical World. And so I'm going to be interacting with some uh, material from it today. So how is it that we go about speaking about Jesus? How do we go about talking about the gospel and uh, uh, Chan has a, a, a chapter that is just in, entitled, um, I forgot the name of the title, a Crafting a Gospel Presentation. And what he does, I think, is really good in that he identifies the essentials of what the gospel are, but then recognize that in our sharing that with others, that the Bible uses a, a wide variety of metaphors for our relationship with God that can, ha can and do have gospel import. 
uh, they they give you that entry point into speaking to people about Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at some of those. So to begin with, Chan says there are four tasks in evangelism. One is presenting the gospel elements. Two is using a a set of coherent biblical metaphors to organize the elements. Three, by necessity, leaving out other biblical metaphors. And four, being sharply focused, penetrating, and to the point. So uh, what, he's, what he's getting at is that that idea of falling in love with the gospel all over again that we talked about last week has certain fundamental elements that must be included that are, are part of the gospel. And then remembering that the Bible speaks about that in a variety of different ways. And in your conversation, listening in a way that helps you enter into that conversation in a way that may connect with the individual in a way that they would understand. So his first point is, uh, presenting the gospel elements, and I'm going to invite you to to identify what the essentials are for the gospel elements. What must we speak about? Uh, it may not all be in one conversation, remember that, uh, but what must be part of a, a gospel conversation? Dan. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, God has to be part of the subject. Uh, this, is, uh, this is essential because of our, our relationship. Yep. Okay, good. Yes. Very, very much so. This will come up in my sermon a little bit later. Yeah, Nick. It must be that, that there's something that has, has caused us to be, uh, to be judged by God, and the biblical concept of sin must be part of that. Good. Jody. Yeah, the, yeah Jesus, uh, and under, under that simple heading, Jesus who died on the cross for our sins to take our condemnation, uh, and this is the only way of, of salvation. Hit all of them except the last one that uh, the Chan mentions is, what are the blessings of the gospel? <laughs> well, funny it is, actually, uh, but if I define it correctly, the best life now Eternal life that has consequences of, of heaven, but also consequences for, uh, for the here and now, and not defined by material uh, blessings. Good, so these are the essentials of the, um, of the gospel that are part of, our, uh, of the conversation. And when we think about then communicating those things, as I, as I suggested, uh, following Chan, he, he's, he says to use a, a set of coherent biblical metaphors to organize those elements. So just think a little bit about some of the different ways in which the gospel is presented by Jesus himself in the New Testament. And you'll find that there isn't, beyond these fundamentals, there isn't one tried and true method or one tried and true gospel presentation or one tried and true tract that, uh, that can be used. Uh, now, in saying that, let me, let me observe that uh, that I have tracks and I use tracks. I think they're a good conversation starter. I have gospel, I've memorized gospel presentations and I think they're useful to become familiar with 
all of these parts of the, of the essential elements of the gospel. And uh, I particularly uh, have known and have used evangelism explosion throughout most of my, uh, my ministry. I, I like that presentation. I also know the bridge analogy that the navigators use. Uh, but in, and, I, and I encourage people to actually become familiar with things like this. Uh, because uh, being familiar with the gospel lends towards your being at ease then to speak about it with others. Uh, so uh, saying that these things are useful uh, doesn't mean we, uh, uh, they are the only way to speak about the gospel. And when I say that there are many metaphors, I'm not saying never memorize or never use those tools that may be helpful to you. That being said, I want to look at one example of Jesus' uh, presentation of the gospel. We've actually done this in the first two lessons that I've had. There have been two separate presentations of the gospel, uh, Jesus to the demoniac and Jesus to the, uh, to the rich young ruler. Uh, this week, I want to look at Luke chapter 10 at a presentation to the, uh, the, the, the lawyer. Luke chapter 10, and I'll read starting in verse 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Pause there and say, zing. <laughs> um, Jesus knows how to penetrate the heart of man, doesn't he? So the lawyer gives a, a right answer about God, about his holiness, about our response to him. A response is, uh, is one of faith and obedience. And uh, Jesus says to the lawyer, uh, do this and you will live. And immediately, what does the lawyer do in response? Well, he, he starts to, to justify himself because of that really penetrating question or, or comment that Jesus makes. But he said, wanting to justify himself, uh, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now this very familiar parable. And we often think about this in, in terms of, of care of neighbor. But I want you to see this as a, as a gospel tract that Jesus is giving to this lawyer. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the palace, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, 
And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So let's talk about the gospel in this tract, in this parable. Where is the confrontation happening between Jesus and this lawyer. I said there's a kind of a zinger, a a penetrating statement by Jesus. Where does Jesus touch kind of like a doctor and say, does it hurt here? So where's the gospel happening here? Hmm. He really was, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. This is that. The, here's that essential element of sin that is coming in. He doesn't use the word sin, but it's all about sin and about his approach to being right with God. It revolved around him doing everything that was right. He's right about the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. First table of the law. And your neighbor is yourself. Second table of the law. Do this and live. Do this and you will live. That's the approach to everlasting life, to, or, or entrance into heaven by a lot of people. You will get to heaven by doing good works. And this lawyer, feeling the, the, the pressure or feeling, ouch, that hurt, begins to justify himself and says, well, if I'm to love my neighbor as myself, then who is my neighbor? Really? Who is my neighbor? Uh, I can demonstrate that I have loved a bunch of people, but who is my neighbor? He's, he's trying to fence in where his righteousness is in a way that is, is, uh, is not as searching as God would have it. And so here's, the, here's where Jesus lays a finger on his sin. And how is that demonstrated by the Samaritan? Yeah, love without prejudice. Uh, he, he was the neighbor, or he showed he showed love to his neighbor, and uh, and in a way that this lawyer was uh, condemned or struck to the heart with. Uh, with a recognition of his own falling short of God's commands. So this is a metaphor or uh, one metaphor that we can use to think about how Jesus uh, shared the gospel with, uh, with this individual. Let me pick out just a couple of others from, uh, from the Bible to invite you to think of Jesus's uh, gospel presentation. We may dive into them in, in, in later weeks, but um, how did Jesus share the gospel uh, with the Samaritan woman at the well? What are elements uh, that he draws to her attention that touch on these different aspects of the essential elements of the gospel. He really does. Isn't it fascinating how how he takes her desire for this living water? He presents, says, uh, you're, you've come to have water, but 
uh, I offer you living water that will that if you would drink you would never thirst again. And there's a peaking of interest there that that leads into a deeper conversation about what that means. So there he started with uh, with the blessing of living water. That's not the only thing he spoke about, though, is it? What else did he speak about with her? Pardon me? Sure, yes. Uh, her husband or husbands or what her marital situation was now. What element, Henry, would that be speaking to? Yeah. It's true. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. So the aspect of, uh, of God's holiness and her sin is highlighted, highlighted. And it's highlighted by Jesus himself. Uh, think back to the, the first week where I, I said what, we're, what we long to do in evangelism is bring people into something of a confrontation with Jesus. We want them to, uh, to recognize who Jesus is and in that confrontation be able to share the, the warnings as well as the blessings and the invitation for forgiveness of sins. So Jesus being having all knowledge is an attribute of God himself. As a prophet of God, at least, there is a, a confrontation that takes place. Let's take another one. Uh, how about Zacchaeus? What was Zacchaeus's, what was he bound up in, we might say? <laughs> sure, extortion, underlying that greed. Um, how does Jesus confront him. Yeah. 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 Dave. Yeah, that's true. The tax collectors are still dreaded and shunned. <laughs> Knock at the door. Hello, I'm from the IRS. <laughs> uh, close the door, quick. Um, there is uh, just, he did this with the Samaritan woman too, didn't he? There's compassion on someone who was, would have been, been shunned by by the society. Uh, here's a tax collector who was shunned, and he said, "Today I will eat with you at your house," uh, which would be a high honor, a high privilege for a rabbi to come to someone's house. Someone who was rejected and hated by the uh, the religious and and Jewish community, but Jesus came to him and showed compassion to him. And uh, think of his response as well as demonstrating gospel faith. How does he demonstrate his faith? Remember what is the, the root was extortion and greed? In repentance, what did he say he would do? He was going to pay it back. Everything, and then some, not just what the Bible required, but he would, uh, would go out of gratitude. He would go even beyond that to, uh, to speak of, of his newfound faith. Um, here's some others you could jot down and think about on your own. Think about uh, Nicodemus, man born blind. Think about... Um, Paul going to the Gentiles later. This is uh, uh, how the gospel goes to others. 
Peter speaking to the Jews, uh, John's promises of eternal life. So several uh, different personalities, uh, several different individuals uh, uh, speaking to a a wide variety of, uh, of a cross-section of, of people in the Jewish society, from high to low. Nicodemus would be a, a, a ruler. There would be a Roman centurion. And there would be those that were, uh, were poor and outcast that, that we've, uh, we've already talked about. So um, metaphors then for the, uh, the gospel or uh, the ways in which we talk about these things can be very helpful to, uh, to even think about ourselves so that when you are in a conversation with individuals, uh, you can have at your, uh, at your hand or in your mind ways in which a conversation can, can move from something in, in this world to a conversation on a deeper spiritual level uh, similar to, to Jesus's and to the apostles' uh, conversations. So what I have here is a chart that Chan has that, uh, uh, that lays out uh, some different metaphors for these different aspects or different elements of the gospel. So I'm going to invite you to work with me to fill in this chart Across the top, we have God, sin, and a response to the gospel that, uh, uh, that would follow along in these, in these different metaphors. So I'm going to fill out the first one and then invite you to uh, help me fill out the others. So one metaphor that, that we can think about, um, one framework that the Bible talks about who God is, is that, is that God is, a, is the creator, that he is the one and only God who has made all things, and that, that uh, we are a work of his hands. We are creatures that are made by him. And when we, uh, when we in our sin do not acknowledge God in this way, the expression of our sin can be found in the form of idolatry. If you think about, uh, about the failure to acknowledge God as God, the failure to acknowledge God as the creator, what we end up doing is we elevate someone else or something else into God's place, which is the definition of idolatry. It's, you might tend to think of idolatry as carving out a statue and bowing down to it, and that is one form of idolatry. There are... are are many subtle forms of idolatry. And I would, I would suggest that, the, uh, that Zacchaeus would be an example of, of this, that by his greed that he had elevated his love of money to the place that he was worshiping that, and it was, uh, was thereby uh, was sinning against God. A response to, uh, uh, to that... Uh, and by the way, I like uh, Chan's definition of the response, uh, repent, deny oneself, humble oneself, and give up everything to follow Jesus. <laughs> repent, deny oneself, humble oneself, and give up everything to follow Jesus. Uh, so that'll be worked out in, in, uh, in each of these different metaphors. But in this line, we would say that if our failure is to not acknowledge God as God or as the creator and to thereby worship something else, worship the create, creation or the creature instead of God, Romans 1, 
then the proper response is to repent of that and to worship the one true God. There's one word here. Our, the response is to, is to cast ourselves upon the mercies and grace of the one true, true God and to worship him. And uh, again, this is where, where you can see Zacchaeus in, uh, in, in his response denying himself and giving up everything in order to follow Jesus. All of the sin that had entangled him, he was, was throwing away in order to follow Jesus, which is uh, essentially an, an act of worship. So let's go on to these next ones, and I'll invite you to, uh, to suggest how when we talk about God and Jesus Christ in the sense of royalty or as king, what would be the way in which in the world uh, there's a, a sinful response, a failure in acknowledging God as king, and then what our response should be. So... If God is king, what would sin be? Good. Bad. Rebellion. Words or any other description of that? Yeah, Dan. Sure. Yeah, I'm the king. Yeah. But the economy. Maybe better under judge, but the way you said it, the idea that that I am uh, I am the master of my own life or my own my own reality. That's a real buzzword today, isn't it? I I define my own reality. I might you you might think about that actually as I'm talking about it. Think about. Uh, that very common concept of I define everything as being a, having to do with, well, who really is the king? What would a response be? If someone, if you, you're confronting someone with this, what would a response be? Submission. I define submission and how does that how is that a an expression of faith and repentance? Sure, yeah. Wow. Good. Yeah, nice. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Not only recognition of someone else being an authority, but uh, acknowledging it and accepting it um, as being a as being my response. Think of that denial of self that is part of repentance and then casting ourselves upon, upon God for his mercy. How about uh, holy? What would the sin be? You can't just say unholiness here. <laughs> Worldly, good. What was the first word you used? Carnal? All really good biblical concepts here. What might be a, a word or concept that uh, someone who's never read the Bible would understand? You can define all of these, which uh, these are good words, but they fall a little bit under Christian vocabulary that you might, uh, might need to, to take the time to explain. What might be another explanation of it? Vulgar. Powerful word. Well, Chan uses a word, and I'll give it away. Of holiness as being clean. 
what would sin be? Unclean, dirty, yeah, yeah. How about then a response? What do you think, Suki? That, uh, this comes through in a number of New Testament passages, I think. And it's, it's related to the healings that Jesus did. Think about the woman with an issue of blood. Um, there is an uncleanness uh, by the Old Testament law that meant that she was separated from the worship of God let alone just the physical side of things. But in, uh, in Jesus' healing of her, there is now a, a cleanness that is brought to her, not just physically, but spiritually. And she is now brought back into the fellowship of, uh, of the people of God, the ability to go and, and to worship him. How about a judge? What was that again? Ah. Hollessness. Toleration? Yeah, oh, wow. That's a... That's a Economy comes out in a different way. Uh, instead of God being the judge, I'm the judge, and uh, I will I will execute uh, execute judgment on uh, individuals. How about a response? Oh, so, sorry, Vicky. Vigilante. Ah. Yeah. You get the Clint Eastwood Award today, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, vigilante justice, cowboy justice. Um, we laugh a little bit, but there's something in us that uh, says, yeah, yeah, he got his. But, uh, but God is the judge, and uh, we are not. So how about a response to this? Nick, justify. Very significant theological term loaded with with the law of God that we must be right, we must be righteous, we must be perfectly righteous, and we are not. And in our salvation, God declares us to be righteous, not because we are really without sin, but because Jesus is. And Jesus' righteousness is given to us, is imputed to us. A very good theological term again, what might be a... a a word that, or a way of speaking of these things with others may not have read the Bible or, or thought of these things. Dave? That's very good, yeah. No, R.C. Sproul. This is not an umlaut thing. I 
I, I do notice that uh, R.C. Sproul's handwriting is not much better than mine. And <laughs> it sounds better, though, on a chalkboard, doesn't it, when he's gone? And it's <laughs> we need to create something with these whiteboards that can have the sound of a chalkboard. It sounds a lot more significant. Acquitted. Um, that is a legal term that I think is uh, commonly understood. Mercy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's merciful to us, and our response is not only to be grateful for that mercy, but to show mercy to others. Uh, maybe you've heard the little phrase that sometimes people will use, just as if I'd never sinned. It's the way that God looks at us because of the righteousness in, in Christ. Dave. Ah, yes. Yeah. Just as if I had always obeyed. This goes back to the lawyer, doesn't it? Where that, uh, that zinger comes in because he thought he'd always obeyed until Jesus put it to him. <laughs> Have you really obeyed the law of God? Well, who is my neighbor? Good. Well, we don't have time to go through these others. If you would, uh, would like, um, uh, I'll leave this on the, on the back table, and you can take a picture of this table, how, how Chan fills it in. Or you can leave it blank and do a little work on your own to think through this, and then come and ask me next week to take a picture of it. But either way, I'll, I'll leave it on the back there so that you can begin to think about uh, the conversations that we have with others that are going to be about God and sin, the condemnation for that sin, the consequences of it, the offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then our response to it. So um, hopefully a, a little workshop like this, a little give and take, will get you thinking about listening to individuals as they... Uh, they speak about their life and think, uh, how is it that they are perceiving the world? How are they thinking about God and their relationship to him? How can I join in that conversation in a way that leads them to a confrontation with Jesus? Does that make sense? Okay, any questions? Thank you. Let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we do thank you that you have not left us in darkness. We are confronted with the light of Jesus Christ and uh, the light of your law. To your praise, you've given your spirit to us so that we, uh, we've recognized ourselves. And God, as we... As we speak with others about this, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us insight, uh, give us a, a, a heart to listen to these other individuals in a way that, uh, um, that understands uh, their, their, their concept of the world, their concept of you and their condition, and uh, give us your spirit to lead us uh, to speak then about eternal matters in ways that might be understood. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, you're dismissed.